Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Debar Yushalayim in Harnof, Jerusalem. Welcome to Berachot, Chapter 1, Halacha 6. This is the last uh, Halacha in Chapter 1, and we're going to finish it up today. Uh, a few things about Halacha 6. Halacha 6 is going to cover a lot of other topics about the Shema and the structure of the blessings, why it is the way it is. And one of the other things that's unusual about what's coming up is that uh, it's going to reveal and show you uh, changes in the prayer when the Mashiach comes. So a lot of this is kind of like you and I are walking through a warehouse and looking at things that are stored up that are going to be taken out when the Mashiach comes, Zerat Hashem, very quickly, and that we're going to see how the prayer changes are going to uh, structurally change and some of the concepts of, of how prayer is going to change uh, when that does happen. And so we're getting a, an advanced view of how that is, but you know this is recorded and this is in storage until... You know, until that comes, then the sages will, you know, uh, take this out from, you know, this is one of the places that has that and and reprint the prayer books. So that's going to be very interesting. And one of the other things about this is that we're going to be getting into this whole concept about uh, the exodus of Egypt and remembering it. So that that's going to be another thing that gets covered. And then there's going to be a uh, dispute about a custom that was done in Bavel and a custom that was done in uh, Eretz Yisrael on the way the prayers are. And that's going to give us a, a deeper insight onto how uh, the, the Shema blessing is, is organized and structured. And that's what's going to take up uh, most of this. But this is a, a rather agotic um Halakha, there's a lot going on behind the scenes, and uh, you could spend a lot of time studying this and, and get a lot out, because there's really a lot here, and there's a lot of depth, and uh, if, you, if you want a, a halakha that uh, will give you a lot of uh, insight about things that are, are going to be, that's in here. Now, the Yerushalmi does record... Uh, a lot of cases, uh, things that will be in the future, uh, so that you have you have things that are recorded for now, but it also does record uh, things that that will be. One example of that is when the king comes and when uh, they're they're ending the shviyas year. Uh, the 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 rule for kiddush for ending the shviyas year for the king, that's that's listed. Uh, that's that's going to be in Masechet Rosh Hashanah Yershalmi, and that's going to be uh, listed in there so that uh, they're going to know what to do. In other words, the sages are going to show, uh, or you know, the king will, will, will know because he'll be so learned that he'll know, or you know, the sages will learn it with him, and uh, he'll, he'll be able to have the right uh, kavana to do that mitzvah that is stored up for the future, but is not around for today. So Halakha 6 starts off, it's going to start talking about the nighttime Shema and whether you have to have the mention of the exodus of Egypt in the nighttime Shema. Now, you know, we know that in the morning Shema, we know that there's the Shema and there's uh, the Vaya Im Shmoa and the Vayomer. Okay, so you have three structures there. Of of uh, of what's uh, you know how it's being organized and the first two passages uh, you you'll know are recited at night and they're also uh, recited uh, you know and and that it, it's stating um, you know explicitly you know in there in each of each of these uh, verses it says you know when you lie down and you arise so then. You have to wonder. Well, you know, what about what about this third passage in there? Because you know that's talking about tzitzis, and tzitzis you don't you don't do tzitzis at night because that's talking about so that you may see it, and one is not required to mention at night. But what's interesting about it 
is that there's another passage that's uh, talking about the Exodus of Egypt, and the Torah obligates us, basically, to remember each and every day. That's in Devarim 16. You can, you can check it out there. And the mission is really going to cover whether the Exodus must be remembered each and every night as well, or whether we, we recite the third passage of the Shema at night, which is talking about the tzitzis, on account of the, mex, uh, the mention of the exodus of, of Egypt. So there's a lot of question on, on, you know, structure. So, you know, you have at night the mention of tzitzis, but you don't do the mitzvah of tzitzis at night. And then you also, you know, there's a question, well, do you do, you know, do you do something saying the remembrance of Egypt at night? What about that? Mishnah starts off and says, we mention the exodus from Egypt at night. And Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria said to them, I am nearly 70 years old, yet I did not prevail over my colleagues and convince them that one must mention the exodus of Egypt at night. Now, Elazar ben Azaria is a special, uh, special sage who was appointed for a very short time as the head of the academy. And uh, he was like Konasi, uh, ultimately, uh, because they brought back the old one. But there's a rule in Judaism that you can't go down in Kedusha. Things can't be degraded in Kedusha. So you can't take him down from his, his uh, post. So he was left as, as co-head um, co of the academy and, and Konasi. And uh, he was appointed at a very early age. He was, he was actually appointed uh, at 18, and then he had his, his hair uh, uh, grow uh, to be gray. And so it was like he was older than he actually was. Now, the way it was was Elazar ben Azaria was, was picked to pick to replace Rabban Gamliel as the Nasi when he was just 18. And uh, he felt that he was not worthy of the position. And this miracle happened where um, his hair turned you know, white overnight. And he looked like an old man uh, with this miracle. So the, the idea is that he, he actually kind of was a young man when he said it. But he looked as if he was old. So... Uh, the the Haredim about this mission is commenting that according to the Bavli's approach, Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria's comment is uh, somewhat difficult to understand because if he was you know actually a young man, why is it he surprised at his inability to prevail over the colleagues? The approach says the Haredim uh, in the Yerushalmi says that his intent is clear that he debated the matter with it with his colleagues his entire life, yet he could not prevail until Ben Zoma explained it. So your Shami formulation is a little bit different, and some might say a little bit clearer about how, how this is working when this is going on. So uh, the, the Mishnah continues, says that, uh, you know, I did not prevail over my colleagues and convince them that one must mention the exodus from Egypt at night until Ben Zoma expounded the law as follows, for it stated that you may remember uh, the day when you came out of Egypt all the days of your life. For the words, the days of your life are derived, we derive the mention, uh, we requ the requirement to mention the exodus during the days, and from the extra all, in the all the days of your life, we derive the additional requirement to mention it during the nights. In other words, what Ben Zoma is saying, which is uh, similar to what um, Rabbi Elazar Ben Azaria, who was the head of the academy and the, the, the Nasi, was saying is that the word kol has a dual meaning and that it can mean uh, either the entire or it can mean all. And basically what this is saying is that Benzoma explained it as meaning the entire day, and he, he's basically deriving that we have to mention the exodus in both segments of a 24-hour day, which is day and night.
so that this extra word all uh, has has some uh, extra meaning uh, behind it. The Shainus Eliyahu was going to say like this, that the sages expound all as meaning all, not the entire. Thus, they derive that the obligation to mention the redemption from Egypt each day will remain in effect even after our redemption from the current exile with the coming of the Mashiach. And according to that interpretation, the verse does not teach a requirement to mention the exodus at night, says the Shainus Eliyahu, but that it's going to be a um, it's going to be a, a mention for uh, future. That's going to be uh, mentioned, says the Shainus Eliyahu, in the future time. That one is basically being said for uh, this time that we have today, and then basically the extra repetition says the Shainus Eliyahu is going to is going to be a uh, for the, the coming of the Mashiach. So the Haredim says about it that uh, this is how the sages had interpreted the verse before Benzoma presented the exposition. Basically, upon hearing Benzoma's approach, they retracted and accepted Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah's view that the Exodus uh, may be mentioned or must be mentioned at night. Uh, I want to I bring out a note that uh, from... Uh, from this, that the, the Maral, uh, in his commentary in uh, Teferis Yisrael, say 52, um, he's, he's saying that uh, the text uh, parallels the Mishnah and Bavli uh, 12b, and the, the Passover Haggadah omits any reference of Olam Haba, which is the world to come, and so that, you know, you read the superfluous all, which is talk about all the days of your life, and that's going to come to include the messianic error. And says the the Maral, he's saying that it actually seems unusual for the term Olam Haba, which is the world to come, to be applied to the messianic error, as this generally uh, this term generally is understood as referring to either a period that will follow the messianic era or to the afterlife. So that's that's a note by the Maral about this, but um, you have uh, in the Shainus Eliyahu definitely this interpretation, and definitely um, you know the Maral is also looking at this like this, where this extra uh, call is going to be looking at a future uh, a future world to come. Now this is not floating in space because actually. That's what the Gemara is going to be getting into. So, you know, you could you could look at it and say, well, how did these guys? How do they know that? Like, wh- where did where do they know this from? And and the answer is basically like, well, they know that this extra call is going to be talking about a future messianic time, because actually we're going to be talking about that. So that's how they have this knowledge about it, so that. There, you know, there could be two ways to understand it. That's the other way, and then it's going to start talking about how the the messianic prayer is going to change, and how you have to get a new art scroll book, prayer a sitter, or actually won't need one because your Hebrew will be perfect, and so you'll you'll just get a regular one. But anyway, Baruch Hashem. So the Mishnah continues, and so it says. Um, it says like this. It says that uh, you know. It says that the extra all for the days of your life. You know, we derive the additional mention, the the additional requirement to mention it uh, during the nights. And the sages say that uh, from the the words the days of your life, we derive that there is a requirement to mention the exodus from Egypt in this world before the coming of the Mashiach. And from the superfluous all, as in all the days of your life, the Mishnah says that we derive this requirement, uh, that this requirement will prevail even in the world to come, which means to include the Messianic era. So the Gemara is going to be getting into uh, all this stuff about uh, what's coming in the Messianic era, and that 
so there, there's there's a lot of of, uh, of things going on here because you know it's not every day that you're sitting there looking at what's going to be uh, you know in 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 the in the future world. Now the um, the Yershami, uh just as a as a note to uh, parallel what the what the Bobli's talking about. So the Yershami does not dispute the facts about Rabbi Alazar ben Azaria of the incident mentioned in the Bavli with the miracle of the whitening of the hair of Rabbi Alazar ben Azaria, um, and and that that is is mentioned explicitly in uh, chapter four Halacha one, uh, but uh, there was uh, you know it was stated that at the time he was sixteen years old when it happened and not eighteen. So the Bavli is saying he's 18, Yashami is saying he was 16 at the time. And so there's a little bit of difference between there. Uh, you can check with a, uh, a Torah scholar and ask, could it be that, that you know, how could it be so that there's no uh, contradiction between the Yashami and Bavli? Many times uh, there is not a contradiction of, of things. It might just be a, um, a a period of time when you're looking at it. For instance, um, perhaps you know something happened, and so that there's there's just nuance in it, and there's no contradiction at all. But you need to check with a Torah scholar how that is. Um, the Bavli is going to maintain that Rabbi Alazar Rabbi Alazar Ben Azaria uh, was making the comment about the day of the appointment as Nasi, so he must have meant that I am like a 70-year-old man. You can see that in the Bavli in Barachot 28a. And the Yershami here is going to maintain that he made this comment many years later, and he meant I am nearly 70 years old. So you can check out from, you know, standard texts like the Rashi, on how the Bavli understands Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah's remark. And uh, you can also check out uh, the Rambam's commentary in the Mishnah if you want more detail. But uh, anyway, let, let's get into it. So the Gemara is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to talk about a Barisa pertaining to Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah's statement that he was nearly 70 years old. And the Gemara says that even though Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah assumed a position of eminence, he had longevity. And the Gemara draws an inference, and this tells us that ordinarily, a position of eminence shortens the days of a person's life. Now, this is a bit of, of Torah and Gemara and oral law wisdom for you. And so that when you walk around the world, you should be able to understand and see the world in a better way. Here's how the Haredim understands this. He's saying that the Bryce's statement that Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah had longevity, even though uh, he assumed his position of eminence, indicates that this was an unusual occurrence. So how did Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah merit longevity? And by the way, you can you can see uh, related uh, teaching in Bavli, Pesachim 87b, says the Haredim, where it says over there, you know, woe to authority for it buries those who possess it. And the Haredim says that uh, Rashi understands this to mean that when one wields authority with arrogance, it causes them to die uh, early and prematurely. And accordingly, uh, the Baraisa says uh, the Haredim would, would mean that Despite Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah's eminence and high position, he always conducted himself with humility, so he merited living out his full allotment of years. So the Yafe Marah explains that actually Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah's longevity was miraculous, but that's a key point for, for you in your life that if you do have a position of eminence, and you do have a position of authority, you better be humble because if you're not, you're going to be shortening the days of your life. You're going to be taking a scissors and cutting 
a piece of your life off and you're not going to go as far you're what if 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 life were like a a ribbon it would be like you snipping off a piece of it and that's what happens when you're not humble this is an idea that's in the bavli and in the yershami and this is coming from the sages on what happens to these people and what happens if you don't have this characteristic of humility so it's really important to work on your midot and it's really important to to uh, notice it in your lifetime if you see people that are Jewish and that are in a position of humility or uh, authority you should encourage them with this Gemara that you know the sages say that if you wield your position of authority and you have you know you're haughty and you're arrogant and you're you're not humble that you're going to shorten your life and this is the wisdom of the Torah and everything that the Gemara says is true and whatever this Baraisa says or any of these Baraisas these are true whatever Rabbi Yochanan says whatever Rab Rabbi says whatever Abaya says this is as true as any of Newton's laws of physics, just like E equals MC square from Einstein. This is absolutely true. And they're telling you that with the, the Das Torah and the knowledge and wisdom of the Torah and the oral law, that is you're gonna you're gonna see a shortening of life. In fact, how appropriate is it? Because you saw that with Pharaoh. This is not out of place because you know you saw Pharaoh. Um, uh, perhaps die at an early age. One of there's three opinions in the Midrash Rabbah about what happened to Pharaoh. One opinion was that he died in the in the uh, when the waters came back in. Um, but anyway, there's two other opinions that uh, he went to uh, that one. There's one opinion that he went to uh, Bavo, and there's another opinion that that uh, he went back to rule, but. Uh, there, there is an opinion that that he did die at that place. Uh, you see other cases of of arrogance where where it shortens people's life, like in in the case of uh, the advisor to the king, where uh, Elisha the prophet comes and and predicts that oh, you know the the food prices tomorrow are going to be very very cheap. This is during a siege of the city of Jerusalem. And the advisor to the king starts laughing at the prophet, and he said, and the prophet replies back to him. He says, "You will see it tomorrow, but you will not benefit from him, from it." And uh, you know, a, an amazing event happened that scared off the entire army, and they opened up the city doors. And who opened the doors was the king's advisor, and the advisor saw that all the food was left and all the people surrounding the city the army ran away and all of the people behind him trampled the advisor and it came to be exactly like what Elisha the prophet had had said and this man of authority shortened the days of his life and of course you see that with Haman and you see that with with uh, many of the people who were in charge of the invasion uh, from Assyria and you also see that uh, with some of the wicked kings uh, in Israel, and and you can see that today. So everything that the Gemara says is wisdom that you should internalize and take it very seriously. And if you are in a position of authority, be careful. The Gemara now is going to get into this dispute as to whether the third passage of the Shema which is the Vayomer. The Vayomer has a lot of meaning. There's a lot of meaning because it, it parallels to uh, very special uh, things in the, in the Humash. So there's a lot going on there. And the Gemara says that, you know, about this third passage in the Shema, there in Bavel they say, at night one need not begin the passage of Vayomer at all. So, again, if you want to know about the, the proper way to do the prayer, please check out um, the Shulchan Aruch. It's going to tell you how it works. 
But this is just showing you so that not to tell you what the halacha is necessarily, but to show you how the structure of the prayer works so that when you do it, you can be more mindful of it and do it in a better way because you'll know what's going on. But this is not necessarily the halacha. And if you want to understand it better, just work with a rabbi, get a Haredi rabbi, get the Shulchan Aruch or the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch and, and go through it with him. And you can go through the Bavli sources to see why it's like that. And, and you'll, you'll be able to get a working knowledge of how it works. But nonetheless, this is very important to be in here so that you can see the way that things are ultimately formulated. Again, this is not going to be the halakha, but it's very important to record this stuff. Here's how the Radom uh, says about this custom. The Babylonian sages exempt a person from reciting Vayomer at night because the mention of tzitzis, which is the primary subject of the passage, is not performed at night. And the Gemara is now going to explore, says Heredium, uh, how one who follows their opinions fulfills this requirement to mention the Exodus at night. Now, you can check out the opinion of the, Bob, uh, the Babylonian sages. That's in Berachot uh, Bavli 14b. Anyway, Gemara says that, that uh, there in Bavl, they say at night, one need not begin the passage of Iomer at all. But if one did begin it, he must complete it without omitting any part. And the Gemara continues and says, but... The rabbis here of Eretz Yisrael say, at night, one begins the Vayomer passage and does not complete it. Rather, basically what this is saying is one recites the beginning and end while omitting the middle. So this is a custom, okay, of Eretz Yisrael at that time. And uh, the Shana Eliyahu in chapter 2, Safe 2, is saying that the word emet, which is, uh, this statement of truth uh, was the first word of the of the of the following blessing, where it says "true and faithful," where it's saying "emet ve'amuna," and where it's saying about you know true and upright, and they would proceed to recite. Uh, they would they would proceed to recite it afterwards. They would proceed to say "true and upright" after that. Now. The Haredim explains about this, that the custom in Eretz Yisrael was to recite an excerpt from the third passage at night as follows, where they would say, Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, speak to the children of Israel and tell them, I am Hashem your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt. So that's how you can see that um, the, the mention is done at night of, of Egypt. And I am Hashem your God, true. So this mention of Exodus... Um, is, is, you know, they, they did mention the Exodus and they admitted the part that was talking about the tzitzis because they were holding that the uh, tzitzis is not a mitzvah that you do at night. So they worked in, in their custom where uh, this part was done um, uh, so that you just had the Exodus at night because, I mean, first of all, the Exodus actually, you know, did happen at night. Um, the Bob, the Yershami says, Yershami says that that's when it started and that, uh, you see a lot of the people streaming out in the morning, but the, the process actually started, uh, at that night, right, right after the plague came. So, so you could see why, you know, you might want to, you know, have a, a necessity, why there might be a necessity to say it at night or to mention the Exodus at night. Here's what the Haredim says about the stuff that's going on, on in Bavo. He's saying that it would be possible to mention the Exodus and not the mitzvah of tzitzis at night by reciting the beginning and end of the passage and omitting the middle section, which deals with tzitzis. And this is the practice that was followed in Eretz Yisrael. But the Babylonian sages rejected that approach because they maintained that uh, once somebody begins to recite a scriptural passage, it is improper to omit any part of it. You have to continue and finish it. Therefore, uh, they exempt a person from reciting the 
uh, Vyomer at night, and they ruled that if one did begin the passage, he must recite it in its entirety. So you see a, that's a disagreement between the sages in Babel and, and in Eretz Yisrael. And the Gemara is now going to ask a question. It's going to say, our mages, I'm sorry, our Mishnah contradicts the rabbis there of Babel, for it states, we mention the exodus from Egypt at night. And basically it's asking, it's saying, you know, if somebody forgot or omitted the Vyomer passage entirely, let's say he purposely left it out, when does he mention the Exodus? Where, where, where is it? In other words, that inside the mention of the uh, Exodus in the Vyomer, the Tzitzis is mentioned in the middle part of it. So if you're going to take that out and you're going to follow the way of uh, how it is in Babel, where you're not going to mention it, uh, in this third part, you're going to leave out the Vyomer section, then where 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 do you dispatch the obligation to remember the Exodus at night? The Gemara is going to answer. Rabbi Ba cited Rav Yehuda. Rav Yehuda, by the way, that's going to be uh, Rav Yehuda. He's going to be uh, a Babylonian rabbi. This is not this is not the Amara Rabbi Yehuda, and this is not Rabbi. Yudah and the sea. This is this is not um, this is not Rav Yudah, Rabbi Yuda the Tana. This is a uh, Amara uh, Rav Yuda in Babel. So Rabbi Ba cited Rav Yuda in the name of Rav. So here's a big authority, and it says basically this is Rav speaking effectively. When omitting the Vyomer passage, they would mention the Exodus by reciting the following. And it says, We thank you, for you have taken us out of the land of Egypt, and you have redeemed us from the house of servitude to give thanks to your name. So that actually kind of seems like a difficulty. The Haredim says that, according to the Babli, the text is as follows. It says that, in the Bavli version, we thank you, Hashem, our God, for you have taken us out of the land of Egypt, and you have redeemed us for the house of servitude. You have performed for us miracles and mighty deeds by the sea, and we sang to you. So this was recited uh, instead of the blessing of Amet by Amuna. After we sang to you, they would conclude it and say, who is like you among the strong ones, Hashem? And then it would continue a bit. So the there, there's a difference between uh, Bavli or Shalmi on this, and um, the the the, ba, the the Gemara is going to bring up uh, a big question on here. So the Gemara says a Mishnah contradicts the rabbis of here in Eretz Yisrael, where the Mishnah states, why does the passage of the uh, ayah im Shemoa precede the passage of Vayomer in the recitation of the Shema, and basically it's saying that because the passage of the ayah im Shemoa pertains both to day and night, whereas the passage of Vayomer pertains only to the day, this implies. I mean, it's asking if it implies that Vayomer is not recited in the night at all. It's that's basically what it's it's asking. It's basically um, it's basically th this. By the way, is referring to something in Berachot chapter two, halacha three, and so basically it's saying that you know Vayomer is just talking about the day, so that you know you know there's this other there's this other passage uh, where you know uh, veya is can be you know meaning you know you know, today, now, and later, which would be night, or it can mean day and night. So, and the other one just means uh, today. So the Gemara is going to answer this. And it says that the Mishnah over there in Berachot, chapter 2, Halakha 3, means that the entirety of the Vayomer passage pertains only to the day, but part of it is recited even by night. That's a, that's a, that's a big question. So, Rosh Cerulio says that the portion that speaks of the tzitzis 
is omitted at night, but the portion that speaks of the Exodus is recited at the night. So, again, please check your um, your Shulchan Aruch to get you know a working knowledge of what is the Halacha Lemaisa today. Um, but anyway, this is bringing up you know structure of what's going on so that you you understand when you open up your prayer book today, you can see why it's why it's like that or why it's not like that. Okay, so a related incident is recited. Rabbi Bob Bar Acha descended to Bavel, and Gemara says he observed them commencing recitation of the Vayomer passage and then completing its entirety even at night. And their practice was not in agreement with the opinions we learned above. That there in Bavel, says the Gemara, they say that at night one need not begin the Vayomer passage, but if one did begin it, he must complete it. And the rabbis here in Eretz Yisrael say that at night one begins the passage but does not complete it. So the Pnei Moshe points out that according to the rabbis of Bavel, they should not have begun to recite Vayomer at all, and according to the rabbis of Eretz Yisrael, they should not complete it. I want to bring out a, a point by um, the uh, Hagas Hagra. That's that's a commentary by um, the Vilna Gon on the Yerushalmi, and you can also see uh, his commentary in the Shainus Eliyahu in uh, chapter two, say two, and he's amending the text, and he's actually uh, amending it so that it says that our Mishnah contradicts, so that. Instead of uh, it saying that um, uh, that that the the Mishnah here uh, says, saying that you know, the Mishnah contradicts, and according to the Vilna Gaon's reading that uh, he put down in in two books, he's saying that this Gemara means that the Mishnah's ruling is contradictory to both the opinion of Eretz Yisrael and the opinion of Bavel. So. Uh, the Vilna Gon, uh reads this as uh, perhaps that uh, there was a custom in Bavel, and perhaps there was a custom in in uh, in Eretz Yisrael, and that uh, the custom uh, uh, did not contradict uh, the Mishnah, but they weren't doing it the way the Mishnah is saying effectively. In other words, that um, the Mishnah is ruling. Yes, says the Vilna Gon, is contradictory to both opinions. But again, we're seeing that uh, these these are basically two different customs, and that um, the customs that they had is still dispatching the obligation halakhically. So so it's a halakhically sound. Both are halakhically sound customs, but it's it's not exactly consistent. Uh, both the Babel and the Eretz Yisrael one. Is not exactly consistent with the the Mishnah's statement, says the Vilna Gon. So uh, I want to I want to bring out a point um, in the Bior Shirim by Rabbi Kanievsky about this to help us to explain it. He's saying that uh, th this approach is unclear because you know the Mishnah uh, is surely difficult to reconcile. You know, with this Mishnah, it's surely difficult to reconcile with the rabbis of Bavel, who say that one does not even begin the passage of Vayomer at night. So why would the Gemara cite it as a challenge specifically to the rabbis of Eretz Yisrael? And he points out, says Rabbi Kanievsky, that possibly the Gemara means that the Mishnah is difficult, even according to the rabbis of Eretz Yisrael, and alluding to that it is certainly difficult, according to the rabbis of Bavel. So, it's, it's a little bit, uh, the, the actual practice uh, in Eretz Yisrael and Babel is going to be a little bit different than, than how the Mishnah uh, records it. Again, if you want to know the Halaha Lemaisa on what is going to be the custom and practice today, please check the Shulchan Aruch. So the Gemara now is going to cite an inquiry pertaining to this matter. And the Gemara is going to say that they inquired before Rabbi Achia, the son of Rabbi Zera, and, and the Gemara says, what was your father's custom? Did he act in accordance with 
the rabbis of here in Bav in Eretz Yisrael, or in accordance with the rabbis there of Bavel. So uh, Rabbi Zera uh, was a great sage in Bavel, and then he came to Eretz Yisrael, and he was also a great sage and a student of um, uh, Rabbi Yochanan. And now they're asking his son, uh, well, how did your father do it? Did he do it like uh, when he was in Bava, or did he do it like when he was in Eretz Yisrael? And Rabbi, Rabbi Achia uh, actually did not know his father's practice, uh, says the Haredim about this. And in response to uh, this question, the Gemara is going to cite the opinions of two of uh, Rabbi Zera's uh, students. Rabbi Hiskia said, Rabbi Zera uh, acted in accordance with the rabbis of here, Eretz Yisrael, and Rabbi Yosa said he acted in accordance with the rabbis of there in Babel. So basically, you know, one opinion is that he began the Vayomer, but he didn't complete it. And the other opinion is basically he began the Vayomer and completed it, like, you know, those... Um, whom Rabbi Bar Ba'acha saw in Bavel. So uh, you have two conflicting opinions, and the Gemara is going to conclude and say that Rabbi Hanina said Rabbi Yosef's view that Rabbi Zera followed the rabbis of Bavel seems more reasonable, for Rabbi Zera would generally act stringently in uh, disputed halachic matters, and they, the rabbis of Bavel, are stringent in this case inasmuch as they disallow reciting the passage in an abbreviated form. So the Gemara says, so Rabbi Zera presumably acted with their practice. So uh, that's a, okay, you know, that's, so that's an explanation of what uh, could have been. And the Gemara now is going to talk about a brisa on the requirement to say the Exodus in the morning. So uh, it was taught in a brisa. Uh, you can check this in the Tesefeta in Berachot, uh, chapter 2, Halacha 1. Basically, here's the brisa. Uh, and the Gemara says, It was taught in a brisa, one who recites the Shema in the morning must mention the Exodus from Egypt in the Met they achieve blessing, and Rebbe says one must mention uh, uh, kingship, God's kingship in a Met they achieve, and others say one must mention in a Met they achieve the splitting of the Yam Suf and the smiting of the firstborn. So let's unpack that a little bit. Uh, the Pene Moshe says that. Although he already mentioned the Exodus uh, in the uh, Vayomer passage, he must repeat it uh, again in the Met Vayetziv because this blessing was instituted as an expression of thanksgiving for our redemption from bondage and deliverance from our oppressors. Basically, he says the Pene Moshe that, you know, we're getting this requirement of doing it. Basically, this is what Pene Moshe is saying. And in the commentary on, on what this Gemara means, that, you know, this, we are required to remember and say about the Exodus to Egypt every day. And, you know, we meet this requirement by saying, you know, from Egypt, you, you redeemed us and Hashem, our God, you know, and from the house of bondage, you delivered us. And that, by the way, is going to be stated in the part in the Amet Ve'etzi, which is specifically there to say thanksgiving for the redemption. So that's why it's going to be over there, because that's basically where that occurs. It's not being thrown in to something that was earlier, because something that was earlier is talking about and referring to something else. They're putting it in here, in this part, because this is specifically the part that was designated for it, for doing that obligation. So we, you know, this is a case of not you know, necessarily combining mitzvahs together. It's having the mitzvahs be separated out, and that's why you could look at it this way. The Pnei Moshe continues and says that, you know, the purpose of the Exodus was for us to accept 
Hashem's kingship. And we fulfill this requirement by saying, and his kingship and his faithfulness last forever. And similarly, you know, our king and king of our uh, forefathers, says the Pnei Moshe. So basically what's happening is that, um, you know, it it's being moved over, says or implies the, the Pnei Moshe that, you know, that, you know, it's going over to this part that we're talking about with these events like the Yam Suf, uh, which is, you know, the final part of the process of redemption for Egypt. And, you know, you have the smiting of the firstborn, which is the beginning of this redemption. And then you have the final part of the splitting of the sea of the Yam Suf. And you can see that when you open up your prayer book today, um, you can see that this is going to be uh, part of the structure of prayer that's uh, going to be in there. And uh, you're going to see why, because, you know, one is talking about the, the starting point and one is talking about the ending point on, on this redemption, which is connecting to accepting uh, kingship of, of Hashem. And that's something that we have to try to do every day. It's, a, it's, it's part of the point, part of the point of remembering uh, the exodus of Egypt. Basically, what this is implying is that that's really a statement of accepting Hashem's kingship every day. That's why it's so important to, to follow what the sages say. And so it's also why it's so important to learn because when you learn, you start to see the meaning of why things are the way they are and why they are structured that way. And then you'll understand, you know, why it's so important to resist every modern urge to try to change all the prayer and structure of Judaism. Why, you know, why it's so important to leave things the way they are and why it's so important to follow a Haredi uh, outlook and philosophy in Judaism because it preserves the tradition that we have from the sages and it preserves the oral law. And, you know, it's not just a bunch of ignorant hippie idealists playing around with things and they don't know what they're talking about. They don't have any reference from it. It's really, you can see the depth of why it's structured this way and the beauty of it. And that's why it's so important to leave things the way they are. They're there for a reason. They function as a very precisely calibrated system and it's well thought out and a lot of these things came from the prophets and a lot of these things came from the gadolim or a lot of these things were part of uh, ancient customs that have become codified and and hardened into what we have today and they're they're part of an ancient system leave it alone so the gemara is going to conclude uh, with these opinions and Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi says, one must mention all of the above, and one must further say, rock of Israel and its redeemer. So one of the, one of the points here uh, by, um, by the uh, Or Chaim about this is that, you know, in communities where, you know, special praises are inserted, in the blessings of the Shema during the Marev on festivals, it's customary uh, to substitute uh, the phrase, blessed are you um, to Hashem who, who redeemed Israel and, you know, blessed are you, uh, you know, King Rock of Israel and its Redeemer. And this phrase uh, is precisely the formula mentioned here by Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi. So, uh, this this does get used uh, by some of the communities in the Mara, in in some festivals by by some communities, and they're following uh, this from Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi. That's why it's so important to follow your custom. That's why you know one doesn't look at Judaism like a buffet where they pick from lots of different customs. Um, the 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 customs uh, every custom that is a legitimate. Haredi Orthodox custom is valid. For instance, if you're from one of these, you know, older uh, Chabad families, uh, and you're not one of these guys who, you know, 
maybe uh, is the son of a Baal Tshuva who uh, you know believes that the Rebbe is Mashiach or something like that, or you know a, a, an older and you know there are a lot of you know Chabad old time families that uh, you know they have uh, you know very good songs and very good you know Torah learning and very good hospitality and uh, you know the only difference between uh, them and you know some other uh, Hasidus is is that uh, you know they you know they came from Ukraine and they have some different songs and and their clothing's a little bit different on on some on some fine points you know instead of a fur hat they'll wear they'll uh, you know the, instead of a strimal they'll wear they'll wear a hat but um, you know we're we're not talking about you know these other you know strange things that come about like uh, people who go to the vans and and dance. Uh, in you know by the by the central bus station in Jerusalem, we're not talking about you know these sorts of things. We're talking about you know real old uh, uh, communities uh, that have a tradition. You know like you know Litfish. I'm not talking about modern. I'm talking about you know the old time stuff or some of the old time German communities or or the traditional Syrian communities or you know the traditional Moroccan. They're all beautiful. You know the the um, you know, they're all valid. You know it's like you know everybody is um, you, you know is doing something that's connected and learning, and everything you know has a, a reason for why it is. And here you can see you know a prayer that does get mentioned by uh, certain communities even today. And it's following something by Rabbi Yeshua Bain Levi, and you know if you're part of a uh, you know, tradition, uh, stick with it. It's good. You know, I, I met a guy in B'nai Brock once who was a Bal, who was a Bal Tshuva, uh, and he knew that he was uh, descended from Ger, and he decided he wanted to become a Bal Tshuva, and he wanted to go back to Ger, and he did. And, um, you know, that was where he came from. That was his roots. He didn't want to pick something else, so he became a Ger Hasid. It was great. And he had a nice family and a nice house. And he, you know, he learned half day, he worked half day, and he had a very good life. And, and, and I'm sure he still has a very good life. Anyway, so, you know, very important to, to be part of a community and that if you're in some sort of strange uh, thing in Judaism that's off, that's not one of these, like, you know, real um, uh, groups that, that has been around uh, and is connected to a you know a, a continuous tradition and a continuous tradition that's grounded in you know Gemara and study of the the Torah and and the laws and it's just something a little bit off you know conservadox comes to mind open orthodox comes to mind open orthodox um, is very strange when you look at it you know they have uh, women rabbis giving Gemara shears all sorts of strangenesses, okay? And, uh, you know, that's out of the norm. And it's weird. And, you know, if if you're attracted to that, come back to Haredi Judaism. Come back and discover, because it is so beautiful. And with more learning, you'll see the, the richness and depth of it in a way that you can never get from these, you know, off new things like conservadox, reform, open orthodox, which is not even, it just has the word orthodox in it, and and uh, modern and all these other, you know, uh, strange things. Anyway, um, having discussed elements that are essential for inclusion in a met blessing, the Gemara uh, digresses to discuss other instances in which Certain elements are essential to a blessing. And Rabbi Simon, in the name of Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi, said, uh, if one did not mention the Torah in the blessing upon the land, in uh, the second blessing of Birkat Mazon, we require him to repeat the blessing. In other words, what this is saying that, you know, if you're in the second blessing of Birkat Mazon, and that's, you know, the blessing on the land, and, you know, that's to thank Hashem for granting us Eretz Yisrael. And if you forgot, you basically have to go back and repeat it. So Gemara asks, you know, what is the basis 
for this requirement. And the scripture states, you know, and he gave them the lands of nations. And the Gemara continues, says, why did he give us these lands? And the Gemara says that the follow the following verse continues and says, so that they may have that so that they may safeguard his statutes and observe his Torah. So there's a similar idea uh, in Devarim in in chapter eight, the first pasuk, where it says that the entire commandment that I command you today, you shall observe to perform, so that you may live and increase and come to possess the land that Hashem swore to your forefathers. So basically, uh, what this is implying, says the Abba is that since Hashem gave us the land so that we can observe the Torah, it is actually in the merit of observing the Torah that we have the land. And thus, we must accompany our thanks for the land with thanks for the Torah. So, there's a lot of, you know, as you learn more and more, there's a lot of reasons for why things are and nuance within it. So when you're saying the blessing of the land, you're really thanking Hashem for the Torah. And really what's happening is it's the merit of observing the Torah that gives us the land so we can observe the Torah. Now, that's a really rich and deep way to think about it and look at it, and that's really what the Gemara is saying. So here's another teaching about this vein. And by the way, this helps us to understand uh, what's going on with the land. Why is the land so important? Why do we care about it? Um, why, do we, why do we talk about a, a day when the Jews will return to the land? What does that mean? And so what, it's also the under current of what that means is that you know when you're when you're having the land you're going to observe the Torah and that also you have this tug and pull where you know if you're observing the Torah you're going to have the land so you know this is really you know a thanksgiving statement for the Torah and mitzvah observance so so that's you know some of the the deeper structure for you know why you know these these concepts are are uh, in in the Torah or in uh, the Gemaras and and what these things sort of mean. Now, there's another teaching in the same vein. Rabbi Ba says the Gemara, the son of Rabbi Acha said in the name of Rebbe, if one did not mention the covenant of circumcision in the Brit Milah, in the blessing of the land, or he did not mention the kingdom of the house of David in the blessing of Bonei Yushalayim, which is, now that's going to be the third passage of Berkat Mazon, it says that we require him to repeat the blessing. So, um, just as a, as, a, as a quick note about that, um, when, you have, when you have the Brit Milah, uh, there is a mention on the land, because the land was promised to Avram Avinu, and in return for observing the covenant of, of Brit Milah, that's mentioned there. So basically, that's going to be from uh, 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 in uh, Bereshit uh, 17, in chapter 17, Pasuk 8, where Hashem commanded uh, uh, about the Brit Milah. And it says, And I will give you and to your offspring uh, after you a land of your sojourners, and basically what this is saying is that, you know, we fulfill this requirement and we're saying for your covenant, which you sealed in our flesh, because this is all, you know, sort of together. So what about, you know, the blessing about Jerusalem and Berkat de Mazon and, you know, the, the mention of King David's dynasty has to be mentioned in, in the blessing on Jerusalem and Berkat Mazon, because Jerusalem was consecrated by King David. And, you know, the rebuilding of Jerusalem is going to provide complete rest from all of the troubles that we have as Jewish people. And only together with the reestablishment of the kingdom of the house of David uh, are we going to have that become completed, because it's and by the way, ultimately, 
there's another uh, couple of sugyas in the Yershami that that talk about uh, the the blessing that uh, the Mashiach is going to give to take over the rest of the land that was promised. So these things uh, are recorded, and, and that's a hint for why the Davidic dynasty has to be mentioned in Jerusalem, because um, that's going to be happening with the reestablishment of the kingdom and the reconsecration. Only the, you know, it's, it's, it, it talks about later on, like how the reconsecration of, of the land is, or, or the, the consecration of unconquered land is going to happen and who's going to do that and how it's going to work. Um, um, anyway, so the Gemara is going to continue and it's going to qualify this ruling. And it says that uh, Rabbi Illa said, if one said consoler of Jerusalem at the end of the blessing instead of builder of Jerusalem in the Berkat Mazon, uh, Rabbi Illa said that he has discharged his obligation to mention the kingdom of the house of David. So that if, if uh, basically if he, um, if he structured it a little bit differently and you know, and said uh, from a different passage that it's still, he still dispatched uh, the obligation. There are some uh, customs that replace the word uh, builder of Jerusalem with consoler of Zion uh, and um, uh, in, in their recitation of the Berkat Mazon and um, Shulchan Aruch rules that it's okay. So, uh, again, always follow the Shulchan Aruch. You're required as a Jew to follow the Shulchan Aruch. And uh, you have to look at your prayer book, uh, which is, you know, presumably a halakhically sound prayer book that fits a custom and, you know, fit and follow the custom which you belong to. So there's going to be a, uh, a new topic. We're going to talk about Avram Avinu. And Bar Kapara said, one who calls our forefather Abraham by his original name, Abram, transgresses a positive commandment. And Rabbi Levi says he transgresses a positive commandment as well as a negative commandment. For it is stated, and your name shall no longer be called Abram. Uh, thus, one who uses his name transgresses a negative commandment, and the verse concludes, but your name shall be uh, Abraham. Thus, one who uses the former name transgresses a positive commandment. Uh, Bar Kapara basically is saying that uh, this phrase is not a negative commandment, but means that your name will no longer be called Avram. And in, in place, it's giving a positive commandment that your name will be Abraham. But uh, Rabbi Levi is holding that uh, not to use this name, that's a negative commandment, and then your name will be is also a positive commandment. So that's, that's uh, the idea then. Now, there's a parallel in the Bavli in 13a, and the Marsha comments about this, and here's a commentary by the Marsha on it. He says that, and he wonders at the fact that most halachic authorities admit the prohibition of calling uh, Abraham Avram, and uh, the Shlach explains that the halacha follows a variation uh, cited in the Bavli that when Abraham received his new name, his original name was invalidated. So uh, there's some, some insight onto what's going on there. Now, this ruling is going to get questioned, and the Gemara says that they challenge this as follows, you know, why the men of the great assembly called him uh, Avram, for they wrote, you are Hashem, the God who selected Avram. Why, why, did, they, why did they write that in Nehemiah? It's in chapter 9, Pasuk 7. Um, so that's a, that's, a, that's a really good question. Gemara is going to answer. And they're going to say that, Gemara says that that context is different, for they meant to say that while he was still called uh, Avram, you selected him. So that uh, basically, 
what this means is that the men of the great assembly praised Hashem for selecting our forefather even before he had the distinction of being named Abraham. And so that's why um, that's why it's used that way in Nehemiah, says the Gemara. The Gemara is going to ask another question. It's going to ask about his wife. And the Gemara says, and you will... Uh, and, and will you similarly say that one who calls Sarah by her original name, Sarai, uh, transgresses a positive commandment? For scripture states, Sarai, your wife, do not call her name Sarai, for Sarah is her name. In other words, he gets, she gets renamed as well. So does the same thing apply? B'nai Moshe says that it is evident from the wording of the verse, Sarai, your wife, uh, basically saying, do not call her name Sarai, says the Pene Moshe. And the other verse, by contrast, states generally, and your name shall no longer be called Avram. So um, basically, uh, it would seem that the Gemara uh, should have stated that one transgresses a negative commandment, for the verse states, you know, do not call her name Sarai. Sarai. So um, the verse uh, contains no positive commandment for the phrase Sarah uh, is her name is merely a statement of fact and not a commandment. That's the comment by the Yafe Mara, and that's a that's a good uh, a good call on on how the wording is structured and how the 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 dictuk of the the humash in the case of Sarai is going to be different from Abraham. And, and that change is going to be different. So the Gemara is going to respond, and it's going to say that in that verse, only he, Abraham, was commanded regarding her to call her by her new name. In other words, they're saying that this commandment does not apply to others. So the Gemara further asks and says, will you similarly say that one who calls our father Israel by his original name uh, Jacob transgresses a positive commandment and a negative one. For scripture says, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. That's a that's a really good question. So what about, you know, that over there? So the Yafei Marah says that, you know, this verse contains both a positive and negative commandment in there. What about that? Gemara answers that there, the second name Israel was added for him. But the original name uh, Yaakov was not uprooted for him. So basically, uh, says the uh, Chudushe Chagra um, in, in, uh, uh, about, about this, he's saying that uh, God himself later referred to him as Jacob. And uh, it was obvious because of that, that Jacob's name was not actually taken away. And for a discussion of why uh, Abraham's original name uh, was prohibited for use while Sarah's and uh, Jacob's were not, uh, you can check out more in uh, the commentary uh, by the Marsha in the Bavli in 13a. Anyway, so um, Gamar is going to ask a question. It's going to say, why is it that Abraham's name and Jacob's name were changed, whereas Isaac's name was not changed. So that's a that's a that's a very good question. So Yafei Marah is pointing out that it would seem that just as Abraham received a new name when he was commanded to do Milah, and Jacob received a new name when he was, you know, when he defeated the angel, surely Isaac should have received a new name when he was brought up to the altar. So why didn't he get a name? That's that's the comment that the Yafei Marah has about this Sugya. And that's a it's a, it's a great insight. In other words, um, you know, Isaac Isaac should have been rewarded for this other thing, which is going up to the altar. And the Gemara is going to answer. It's going to say, with respect to these, basically Abraham and Jacob, their fathers called them by their original names. So the Holy One, blessed is he, later changed the names. But for as for Isaac, the Holy One, blessed is he, is the one who called him Isaac originally. As it is stated, God said, uh, uh, your wife Sarah shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. So 
This brings up a deep uh, concept in Judaism that Hashem doesn't change his mind, that Hashem uh, doesn't have any abrogation. There's no abrogation in Judaism. Uh, by the way, Islam does have abrogation. Here's what abrogation is. Abrogation is a case where God said something and then changed his mind. Or God gave a, 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 a statement of it's like this and then he whatever, things change, time changes, and then he says something else. Uh, in Judaism, we don't have that concept. When God says something that's permanent, that's eternal, that's forever. So when God gave the name of Isaac, that was enduring. God doesn't change his mind. And that's why uh, God doesn't need to go change the name because God is the one who gave the name. So that's the deeper point here. The Gemara is going to digress to discuss all the people whose names were chosen by Hashem. Uh, the Gemara says four people were named by Hashem before their birth. And they are the following. Isaac, Yishmael, Yoshiyahu, and Shlomo Amelech. And the Gemara continues, says, Isaac, as it is written, and you shall call his name Isaac. Yishmael, as it is stated, state, as it is written, and you shall call his name Yishmael. Yoshiyahu, as it is written, behold, your son shall be born to the house of David. Yoshiyahu is his name. And Shlomo Amalek, for it is written, for Shlomo will be his name. So uh, this is this is a uh, you know a deep point. And uh, by the way, Shlomo Amalek had another name as well that was also given to him by Hashem. So Shlomo Amalek was special; got two names uh, named by Hashem. So uh, you could, you could check the 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 Tanakh carefully, and you'll see that. Anyway. The Gemara is going to continue and say, until now we have dealt with the righteous, for only they are worthy of being named by Hashem before birth. So that's interesting that uh, that's going to put Yishmael into that category. Um, one of the things that is, is special with Yishmael is that they do draw their, their strength and their spiritual strength from Hashem and from monotheism. Um, and so they do have a special power in the world. You can see that, like they had a bunch of ragtag Afghan fighters who defeated the Soviet Union, a superpower. Um, that's a that's a that's a spiritual thing. Um, while you know those were a bunch of Pashtuns who it is said that they they were one of the lost tribes. Uh, there were a lot of uh, Arab uh, freedom fighters that were there, but uh, maybe you know maybe maybe we're not always on the side of uh, things dealing with Ishmael. But you can see they have a power, whereas uh, those who are descended from Esau, particularly the Christians, they draw their strength and their power from more of a darker demonic Avodah Zara um, source. So that um, while Yishmael um, does not have a perfect view of monotheism and the, the level of monotheism and the understanding of monotheism, says the Rambam and Mareh Nebuchim, of, of the Ishmaelites is at a lower level, they still are monotheists. And so that's why they have some sort of uh, power that um, does not exist with the um, with with others. So anyway, the Gemara says, you know, until now we have dealt with the righteous, for only they are worthy of being named by Hashem before birth. But regarding the wicked, it is written, uh, the wicked are estranged from uh, the womb, and even uh, even when yet in the womb, they are estranged from Hashem and unworthy. Of being named by him. Ross Aurelio says that we find that Esau would struggle to exit his mother's womb whenever she passed by a house of Avodah Zara. Uh, there's also a comment about that by the Rashi. Ishmael, who is among those 
named before birth, was initially righteous, uh, and though he became sinful, he ultimately repented. And the Ephemera points out that uh, the, there's other Midrashim who mention other instances of people who are named by birth, and there's an explanation at length about uh, the significance of people who are named uh, for birth. So now we're going to get into some of these uh, messianic concepts. And the Mishnah was stated that Benzoma uh, said that, you know, you remember the, the day of Egypt, all the days of your life, and that, you know, is coming to include uh, the nights. But the sages argue and say basically in the Mishnah that it's including actually a statement of the messianic era. And as we saw, you know, that's how the Vilna Gon interprets this as well. And the Gemara cites a Barisa in which uh, Benzoma responds to the sage's argument. And the Gemara goes like this. Benzoma said, the people of Israel are destined not to mention the exodus of Egypt uh, in a daily way in the times to come. And basically, Pnei Moshe is saying that the phrase, all the days of your life, refers to the night, not the messianic era, according to Ben Zoma. And uh, basically his point is that uh, in the messianic day, you're not going to be talking about the exodus anymore. So the Gemara says, what is the basis for Ben Zoma's assertion? And the scripture says, therefore, behold, days are coming, the word of Hashem. Uh, when people will no longer say, as Hashem lives, who brought uh, the children of Israel up from the land of Egypt, but rather, as Hashem lives, who brought up and brought back the offspring of the house of Israel from the land of the north. And basically, this is saying that, you know, you know, from all the lands where, you know, he dispersed the people, that, that the people are going to be coming back, and that we can see the way that this is structured, um, that this is, by the way, in uh, in uh, Yerimahu in 23, in uh, the 7th Pasuk, that it's referring that, you know, in the Exodus Egypt, uh, that it won't be mentioned in the Messianic time. Um, so that's uh, you know, by basically by saying that, you know, if you look at how this is structured, it's not saying, you know, this way, it's saying that way. And that's how you understand that it won't be mentioning it in the future. That's basically what it's saying. It's saying that, you know, it's, you know, what is the basis of assertion? Scripture states, therefore, behold, days are coming, the word of Hashem, when people will no longer say, as Hashem lives, who brought uh, the children of Israel up. From the land of Egypt, and but rather it says, as Hashem lives, who brought up and brought back the offspring from the house of Israel, from the land of the north, and from all the lands where he had dispersed them. So, because it's structured that way, basically it means, says Ben Zoma, that the future, uh, in the future, when the Mashiach comes, that the prayer books will be taking out the mention of Egypt entirely. So that's basically what it's saying. The Brisa is gonna is gonna have the response by the sages. And the Gemara says they said to Benzoma, the verse you cited does not mean that the remembrance of the Exodus of Egypt will be uprooted in the Messianic era. Rather, it means that the remembrance of Egypt, of the Exodus from Egypt, will become an appendage to the remember from the to the remembrance of the redemption from our exile among other kingdoms. In other words, that we're going to be remembering the current exile, and we're going to be also remembering that exile as well. Basically, the remembrance of the redemption of our exile uh, is, is going to be added to it. So the Gemara says that, that basically that you know our exile and our redemption from it is going to be among the kingdoms that you know that uh, among the other kingdoms will be primary and the remembrance of exodus egypt will be ancillary to it so 
the Ephemera says about this that the remembrance of the exodus of Egypt will always be in effect because the Torah uh, has commanded us to remember it, and the mitzvah is eternal. Nevertheless, it will become a se in, it will become secondary because the future salvation will be greater than uh, the exodus. Um, so there there are sugyas that point to um, the future redemption being even greater. Um, that the, the Jews are going to be seeing it uh, and it's going to be happening in an even greater way uh, with an even more open miracle than what you saw from the exodus of Egypt. And so you can see that the prayers are actually going to sh uh, shift around a little bit according to um, the sages so that it incorporates uh, the, the, the current exile. So not just the, the exodus of Egypt, but also the current exile. So the sages are going to cite another instance in which the expression of uh, it shall not uh, being in Yerimaya mean that uh, it will be something that is relegated, uh, that, that it means that it's going to be relegated to the second status rather than totally uprooted and replaced. So that, um, so again, they have this idea that uh, this mention of it is eternal and that that's another way to look at uh, the structure of these commandments that that uh, Shem said, you know, you shall remember it, and that that becomes eternal because the statements by Hashem are always eternal. And so, you know, even though we don't have uh, today the altar, we don't have the eternal fire that's commanded, we don't have the fire for the menorah that's commanded, those are nonetheless commanded by Hashem, so those are eternal and you can't get rid of them, and that's how you know that those things will come back, because we don't have um, we don't have these things as temporary. It says over and over again in the Humash, uh, these are eternal, um, and these these are forever, and you know these are commandments that are forever. So the sages are going to talk about another instance, and the, and the Gemara says, and similarly the sa the scripture states. Uh, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. And they have said that this does not mean that uh, the name Jacob is uprooted, but rather the name Jacob is an appendage to the name Israel. And the Gemara says that Israel is now his primary name, and Jacob is his ancillary name. So basically what they're saying is that uh, just like you know, the name was not replaced, and even Hashem called him later on when he went out of Eretz Yisrael, called him Jacob. It shows that that uh, his primary name was Yisrael, and his backup name, the ancillary name, was Jacob. And just like over here, that the prayers are going to be structured where the exodus to Egypt will be ancillary, and the the current redemption, which other sugyas in both Shas' point that it's going to be in even bigger, uh, more obvious open miracle than the one in Egypt, that that's going to be the one that becomes primary. That's basically what the sages are saying is going to happen to the future uh, uh, prayers. So basically they, they, re they, they turned away ben Benzoma's challenge, and now the sages are actually going to start talking about scriptural support for their opinion that the remembrance of the messianic redemption is going to overshadow the remembrance of the Exodus of Egypt, but not not uproot it, not replace it. It's not going to be like what Benzoma said, where they're going to get rid of it, but that the things are going to shift around. That the primary mention of of redemption is going to be the the uh, the future messianic redemption, because that's going to be uh, even a bigger a bigger open miracle than the Exodus Egypt. And the Gemara says, and similarly, Scripture states concerning the Messianic era, this is talking about Yeshiyahu in 43, uh, Pasuk 18, 19, says, do not call former occurrences and do not contemplate earlier events. Behold, I am bringing forth a new miracle. Now it will sprout and when it states, do not recall former occurrences, this is a reference to the redemption from our exile among the Egyptians. 
And when it states, do not contemplate earlier events, this is a, re a reference to the redemption from our exiles among the other kingdoms. So that's a, that's a, a really deep idea. I want to point out something by the Yafei Mara on that. He's saying that the redemptions from the dominions of Babel, Media, and Greece, those are the other redemptions. And the Gemara uses the term for uh, uh, other kingdoms in a different way here than it did uh, before, uh, when, when it was talking about it before. Uh, over there, it's referring to nations uh, in which, you know, we're currently exiled. So uh, this is really showing that the structure of prayer uh, has to be reorganized when the Mashiach comes, and um, very learned sages uh, will be able to point out and you know learn together with the Mashiach because the, the there is a uh, there is a way to decipher uh, exactly uh, which text uh, should be and where. Um, but we're not going to talk about that now. Anyway, the Gemara basically states, you know, or basically stated, do not recall former occurrences, and this is a reference to the redemption from, you know, our exile, and, um, you know, the other one is talking about, the earlier one is talking about the uh, the, the earlier exiles, which is like Babel, Media, and Greece, and then this, you know, earlier one than that, which is Egypt. And the Gemara continues, it says, when it states, further behold, I am bringing forth a new miracle, now it will sprout. This is a reference to the events that will occur in the times of Gog. So this is a reference to the war of Gog and Magog, which is going to come before the uh, future redemption. Um, and that... Um, just as a as a as a note about this, um, the the expressions where it's saying do not recall former occurrences and do not contemplate earlier events in this in this statement in the in uh, Yeshayahu forty three you know it says you know do not contemplate earlier events right uh, it's it means that you know that's going to be the redemption of Egypt. And, and then also later, you know, the other, the other three kingdoms, you know, you have, you know, Bavo, Media, and Greece. So the, you know, and by the way, you know, the redemption that, you know, the, you know, what we're in today is, is the, is, uh, is the one for Rome, which is really subjugation of Esau. And if you want to understand history, you really have to look at, Torah and Torah history, because everything is an expression of the fulfillment of the divine plan for the creation of the world. And this is really, you know, the last one is really the struggle of Jacob and Esau. And that's why we've always had such a difficult time with this strange religion, which is filled with deception and lies and a Bodhisattva and the spiritual system of Esau, which is Christianity, that was the uh, official religion of the Roman Empire, and and it you know if you take away uh, the entire Tanakh, there's no such thing as Christianity. They need it. They're like a parasite uh, trying to you know feed on the Jewish energy, and and uh, you could see it's right out of everything with the story of Esau. And, you know, we see that uh, their spiritual system will be destroyed uh, in the writings of uh, the prophet Ovadia. Uh, but, you know, this suffering that the Jewish people have had where, you know, they've openly destroyed Jews. You know, they, they used to lock the Jews when the, the crusaders came into the, into the great synagogue in Jerusalem. And they would read from one of the greatest anti-Semitic books of all time, which is the, the Christian Bible, which has some of the most vile anti-Semitic um, language ever about how the Jews are the spawn of Satan and just really just terrible things. And they used to read that book 
while they would lock Jews into the synagogue and burn them to death. Um, they would put Jews into gas chambers and they would force them to convert. And even today, you know, they, they try to twist around uh, the, the Torah and get Jews to convert into a Bodhisattva. And uh, one day that spiritual system of Esau will become destroyed. And, you know, Esau, you know, mixes up the Jews today with, you know, you know, capitalism where Jews now worship money more than a Kodesh Baruch Hu, And they spend their time running after money to go build up the empire of Esau and to use the Jewish talents to build up Esau rather than to go and to build up Torah learning and yeshivot and the strength and spiritual strength of Jacob. And um, basically what this is talking about is that, you know, when the Torah is stating so that, you know, you may all remember when you come out of Egypt, this all, this extra uh, all in the, in the extra all of the days of your life is meaning the, the days of the messianic redemption which will see the full destruction of Christianity and the, the full destruction of Islam and the full destruction of all these strange isms like veganism, which is now a weird, weird religion, and uh, these weird religions like capitalism, which now twists around the, the minds of the people to become working robots and soulless automatons and zombies who just chain themselves to desks and work until they die of heart disease. Anyway, the Brisa continues to clarify the matter, and it states that, Gemara says that they stated an analogy to what is this matter comparable, and it says that to one who was traveling on a road and was co uh, confronted by a wolf, and saved from it, and the Gemara continues and says, so he began to relate the incident of the wolf, and later he was confronted by a lion, and he was saved from it, and he forgot the incident of a wolf, and he began to relate the incident of the lion, and later still he was confronted by a snake, and was saved from it, so he forgot both the previous incidents of the wolf and the lion, and he began to relate the incident of the snake. And so too it is with Israel, the later tribulations cause the earlier ones to be forgotten. Now, I just want to point out that uh, in the, in the uh, imagery of Media, they use a lion. And so in many ways, the, 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 the exile of Media in many ways was, um, you know, very serious because um, the Jews, uh, you know, they 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 felt comfortable over there. Um, you know, they could have they could have returned. Also, in the Babylonian exile, they could have returned. But you know, even even when when uh, the the exile you know was there, when when uh, Darius comes to go rebuild the temple, you know, a lot of a lot of Jews could have returned. And they didn't want to. They wanted to stay in the, uh, you know, in the empire, the Persian Empire, which was uh, symbolized uh, in their own imagery by a lion. Now, why the snake? The snake is 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 really hearkening back to the um, the uh, you know the, the the story in the garden, and this is really uh, the story of. Am Yisrael. This is really the story of the of the point of creation. This is not a statement of Esav, who really is like a snake filled with lies. But this is really a different idea. This is a statement that the you know the failings of Adam and Eve was to listen to this other ideology that was expounded by the snake. The snake basically was giving the first uh, Epicurus argument in the world. And if you look at the, the argument, he's basically saying there is another power and, you know, there is another uh, reality. And it's not just Eno Mavado. And the snake's argument 
persuaded them. And, you know, in the world that you have today, people are so materialistic that uh, they sort of ignore God and they, they pursue other things that seem rational to them, like capitalism. And they run after money and things like that. But the ultimate redemption is going to be fixing the poison that was that was done by the snake. And it's going to go back to the divine plan of what humanity was supposed to be before they fell. And that's the point of, of changing the bracha to, to the ultimate um, fixing. Because it's a bigger fixing than, than the Jews leaving. It's basically something that the, the Jews um, weren't able to do when they left. And they got close to it, but they couldn't quite pull it off. And that was to completely change not only themselves, but the rest of humanity to get rid of the poison from the snake to be able to come back to the divine plan for what humanity was supposed to be before they started to listen to the argument of the snake. It's the ultimate redemption, and it's a bigger redemption than anything else. And that's why the brachas are going to be restructured and that's why you know this is going to be a bigger event now i want to point out that the gemara is pointing out a mention of gog and there's a great uh explanation of what gog and magog is from uh rabbi hirsch in in the in his perush on on the in, in sukkah in the in the in the holiday for sukkah he says that uh, Gog is the roof, and Magog is from the roof. And what, what Rabbi Hirsch explains is that the war of Gog and Magog is actually going to be a spiritual war that's between the people who believe that everything is from Hashem and you, you, you can't build a castle to keep Hashem out, and you can't build a roof to keep Hashem out. And it's the people who build and dwell in a sukkah who, who trust in Hashem and are going to follow in the way of Hashem. And the other is the people who are going to have the belief system that they can um, cut off Hashem from their lives and do things on their own. And that's the deep insight about that from Rabbi Hirsch and very much relates to why the, the statement of this being the incident of the snake is the ultimate redemption for fixing this idea of Gog and Magog, which is when all people will know that there is Ain Od Mavado and only one reality. Have a great day.